Well, good morning. It was a beautiful, uh, difficult week. And again, as Joel already shared, we had two of our own uh, actually standing down in the presence of Christ. And so this is what this is all about. We can get distracted with so many things, and we are here to worship Him and to keep helping each other get to our true home. And so there's a, a part of us that rejoice. And I, I think of Wesley. He said, our people die well. And so far, every saint in this body who has gone to be with the Lord has died sweetly holding to Christ. And I pray that we would just keep growing in Him, that every one of us would find that same joy and beauty when we breathe our last. So we have much to be grateful for, and yet when people are that sweet, boy, it makes it hurt all the more. And so we as believers grieve uh, even deeper because we have agape love, and yet we don't grieve without hope. And so today we... We rejoice and we grieve, uh, but with an amazing hope for what these two sweet saints now are beholding. And so I want to pray as well. Father, we come before you and we thank you that death is no longer an enemy to the believer in Christ. We thank you that Christ walked into it and he took out the teeth of death. Uh, He he took away the sting uh, from the devil. He removed any dominion he had over death. Any power has been taken away. And so for us now, death, our death day is our best day. Our death day is our chariot ride to glory. It's the day where we behold you by, by sight. And so we are envious of our two sisters who now see you in that way. And they don't have to battle wandering minds and decaying bodies and all of these things, Lord. They, they, they just have it all now, and we rejoice with them. And we pray for their loved ones. God, I pray that you would comfort them. Lord, there is a difficulty, there is a pain and a sting to this death that is brought about. There's a curse in it. And so I pray that you would be with them and you would help them to learn how to journey now uh, with just you and, and that their, their purpose in life has not changed. It, it has always been you and that now you will just be with them in a sweet way as they fix their eyes on Christ and run to that finish line to the author and perfecter of faith. So comfort God, comfort your people. Uh, We we heard for all these trials, but we just rejoice with faith that you're purifying it and it's sustaining them. They're being kept by your power. And Lord, it just strengthens all of our faith to look at it. And so I thank you for this. I pray that every heart would be encouraged here this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, if you'll turn with me, we're going to go back to our study in 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 2. This morning, so if you're visiting, we've been studying through uh, 1 Peter, his epistle, uh, the fallen apostle who was restored. They've called him the apostle with a foot-shaped mouth, Uh, and now we're watching the humble, broken, sweet, submissive Peter uh, shepherding us and teaching us excellent things. So we've taken a break for about a month to celebrate Christmas and the New Year, which was such a blessed season around here. So this morning, we'll take back up in it. Uh, we need to, I think we need to put the pedal to the metal, and I'm going to start trying to press a little faster. It's been almost a year, and that is sin to take more than a year to study Peter. So my goal is by Easter to be done, so prayers are appreciated. Let me set the context, though, once again. Uh, we are currently working out the application of the theology and the realities of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have seen in 1 Peter chapter 1. And so we can't miss that or what we're going to study for the next few weeks and months. It'll just be moralism. All you're going to do is try to clean up your life and live a certain way. That's not Christianity. And so you can't forget there's a therefore. You've got to lay your life on the doctrines of the gospel and the realities that came in Christ. Therefore, go live a life worthy of this calling and in light of this calling. So in Peter 1, 1 through 12, we saw the richness of the gospel, and I would love to preach through that again. And then we came to verse 13, therefore. Therefore, what should be our response to so great a salvation? In verses 13 through 21, we saw that our response to God is to hope completely in Him and the coming salvation that is going to be brought in Jesus Christ's second coming to be holy because he's holy, and to conduct yourselves in fear because of how he brought about this redemption was killing his own son on a cross. So have a reverence for this God. And your response then to others 
in verses 22 through 25 was philos. There's a brotherly affection and love. We care for each other. And then he called us to this stretching agape love that forgets yourself and just sacrifices for the good of others. That is the response to this gospel. Is that how you're responding to such an amazing gospel? I've died, and now my life is for the brethren. I am giving it. I'm laying it out. Here's my life. Take my life, Lord. Use it for the good of the saints to be built up into the image of Christ. That is how you respond to the doctrinal truths and the realities of this gospel. Thirdly, to the Word of God in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we thirst for it like newborn babes. We thirst for this Word that we might grow in respect to this salvation. We don't play at it. We don't do the two-minute ladies' Bible, uh, corporate CEO. I, I read that recently, and I keep bringing it up. It was this corporate CEO five-minute Bible. No. <laughs> we, we thirst we get in this word and we, we let it have its way. And God, teach me, show me, mold me, renew my mind. The, the response to this salvation is I want to read and know more of it. And it's known in the word of God. Fourth response is toward Christ in verses 4 through 8 of chapter 2. And it's a present tense participle coming to him again and again. We are those, the response to this salvation is I just keep coming again and again to the one who brought about my salvation. I come to the cornerstone, the living stone. I abide in him. I draw all from him. This is, if you've been born again, you love Christ. You draw off Christ. He is a vine. You're a branch. That is the response to this salvation. Christ, I love you. I depend on you. Apart from you, I can do nothing. You must love Christ and find your strength and dependence in all from him. You, you just can't exalt Christ enough. And then our response toward the church is you once were not a people, but now you're the people of God so that we can proclaim his excellencies. So now we, we love his bride. Uh, we love as we come together and are being transformed. We are showing the world the excellencies of a God who saves. And so the response to the church is to give yourself to it so that corporately people can see the gospel in this very body. And so we are now the people of God. His saving efforts, his favor are on us. He's working out his purposes in the church, and we give ourselves to it. And then uh, sixthly, uh, towards self. In chapter 211, what we do now, our response to ourselves is we abstain from fleshly lusts. These epithumias that rule and reign, we, we, we fight against them. We abstain from them. So my response to self is to fight against these desires for things other than Jesus Christ. That's how I respond to this gospel. And then how do we respond to the world? Well, it says by excellent behavior. Live in such a way in front of this world that on the day of their visitation, when they get saved by your excellent behavior, they're going to glorify God and say, thank you for that saint by the way they lived their lives and shown the light of the gospel. And so that is how we're to live in this world. So that reality is now what Peter is going to now flush out in the rest of this epistle. In very practical ways, we are to silence the ignorance of foolish men by our lives. How do we silence them? How do we shut up the world mocking and ridiculing Christians by excellent behavior? Behavior that conforms to godliness will quiet the critics and silence them. So Peter keeps saying, we're aliens. We, we don't really belong here. Our true citizenship is in heaven. We're just a passing through. But while we're passing through, we have a calling in how we are to live in this world. We are not to check out, not to just say, oh, I don't belong here anymore. I'm going to sit on the rooftop on my pajamas waiting for Jesus to thumb our noses at our government and leaders and structures and our bosses and unsaved husbands. That is not how we're to live. We have a beautiful and unique calling as the people of God among this world that hates God. They hate him, and we have a unique calling as the people of God. And that is why this epistle was being written. The church is suffering great persecution under Nero, and all of the society is coming upon the church. And the, Peter says, there's fiery ordeals among you. It is heated up. It is intense. The unsaved world is literally collapsing upon them. 
And life is hard and difficult in a pagan world. They've been dispersed throughout Turkey. And and so when our government and land are completely opposed to all that we think and hold dear, that's what's going on in this epistle. And that's what's beginning to go on right here in our country. And so this has got to be understood because quite frankly, the church today in America does not understand what Peter is teaching this church in Turkey that has been scattered by persecution. And so I want us to get it so that we can use God's means, God's means to silence the ignorance of foolish men, that they would glorify God on the day of their visitation because of our excellent behavior. I am hungry for that. I want God's means to save this world. I love that. And so I think we've quit using God's means that he's given to save this world. I want you to listen to 2 Corinthians 10. Paul says, I myself urge you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, these human bodies, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare in this world against our enemies are not of the flesh. Did you hear that? Our weapons are not of the flesh. But they're divinely powerful for the destructions of fortresses, which are speculations and guesses that are made against God. So all this foolishness that we're going to look at today and wrong thinking, you can't break it with flesh. You're not going to go in there and change it. There's there's weapons that God has given that will go in and destroy fortresses and bring about salvation to those minds and humans. So what the church has done is it's laid down, and when I say the church, I mean in many places, not everywhere. What the church is doing, it's laid down its weapons that God has given to her. Our our wisdom and our knowledge now in the church in too many places, we're trying to build the kingdom of God with our creative thinking and our abilities and our skills and strategies and structures and systems and and we're we're conforming to the culture and and we're, we're trying to build a church for God and that's not destroying the fortresses that the devil has built. We are fighting flesh with flesh. We're we're, we're trying to moralize America. We're trying to get in and legislate righteousness. Programs that will bring the unchurched and keep them a slave to sin all of their days but happy. And to gather in thousands and disguise the true gospel and tell them that God is just love and that's it. And we are protesting and we're fighting to try to change the world. We're arguing on social media and trying in the flesh to stop and break down these fortresses that the devil has. But the weapons that God gave to us is prayer and the word of God and submissive spirits to God and thus his structures that he has built into society. Excellent behavior. They're being laid aside. We are better at planning and scheming than praying and speaking truth. We've laid down the weapons that were given to us by our commander-in-chief, and we've taken up other weapons that cannot destroy fortresses that the devil has built. They will not destroy them. The church is losing its power in many areas. We have a name that we're alive, but we're dead, and lives are no longer being transformed by giving yourself to the cornerstone and to the body of Christ. We have a form of godliness, but we've denied its power. I love the story of David and Goliath. There's a giant taunting the armies of God, and and no one in Israel would stand up to this massive giant until the young shepherd boy David comes down to battle on an errand. And he hears this giant taunting the armies of the living God, and his righteous indignation is on fire. How dare you taunt the armies of God? And so he says he'll go battle against that uncircumcised Philistine. And so they they put Saul's armor on him, who Saul was chosen because he was a head taller than anyone else. And so he put Saul's armor on, and and it it kind of, it it was a little too big for him. 
is Josh here? I remember my son Josh, he went to watch Taylor's Little League football practice, and he was only six, and they said, hey, we need another player. Do you want to play? And he put on a helmet, and it, he looked <laughs> like a moon helmet. You know, there's a little face and this big, huge helmet, and all I could, every time he put on his football gear, I'd think of Saul's armor. <laughs> And so he puts it on, and it's just he can barely walk, much less lift up the gigantic sword. And so he takes it off, and he grabs a sling and grabs five small stones, and he charges the giant, slings the stone, and it sinks into his forehead. He falls dead, and David cuts his head off, and he says, God fought for me. And I think the church today is clad in the armor of Saul. We're we're unable to respond to the cries of Goliath, and we can't take down strongholds Because we're all dressed in our own doing, our own plans, our own strategies, and our own 10-year goals. And we've come and we're fighting with flesh. And it's just more and more people are not being changed and transformed. Sinners can't find healing for the dominion of sin that is ravishing their lives and their souls. If you're here this morning, I have an answer for the dominion of sin that's killing your life. And, And we, the church, have the answer. God has given it to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so people are quitting on the church because it didn't work. I met with two guys a little while ago, and that was the very thing they said. Why didn't anyone tell me this? I gave up because what I was told did not work. The running to the world for deliverance now, because it's not working, they're they're saying, may the the world give deliverance by their drugs and their, their sex and their pride and the narcissism and all of these things, and they're running to this world. Because we have laid down the weapons that God has given to us. And that's the word of God and prayer and lives that are lived worthy of such a calling. And so I I want us to be so devoted to those means. And I'm watching. uh, It's so fun to be a pastor. I'm watching life after life right now being changed and transformed and testimonies by the power of God through his word and people praying. And I love that. By having true knowledge and loving attitudes, it's, it's, it's the power is working. And so what I want to do this morning then is take up the word and pray, how do we live in a pagan land as citizens of another world? And we live in a pagan land, and we need to learn how to live in it as Christians. So let's take up. We're going to look this morning at verses 13 through 17. <clears throat> Verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king." One illustration before we begin this passage is uh, uh, the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, I love it because the gospel's breaking into society and you get the picture of how do we act and respond to the world and because it's coming in, it's closing in on them and we can get examples as we read through it. And I just want to hit one. Flip over to Acts 16. But for homework maybe this week, go read through Acts and just watch the way the church responds to the government and the things that are going on. Uh, I want to begin, let's start in verse 19. Uh, You you got uh, uh, Lydia is converted here. She's a fortune teller and they, they, they cast the demon out. And in verse 19, when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or observe, being Romans. So they just, they're losing money now because they did this, they're making up things, they're bringing false charges against these men. Now in verse 22, uh, the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beat with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. That is a great mistreatment. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. 
I wonder how we would respond to this. Well, let's look at the early church. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening, listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he, threw his, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped, which they probably should have. They should have run for it, and he knew that that's what they would have done. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself, for we're all here. <laughs> we're all still here. And he called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's about to glorify God in the day of his visitation. And verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately uh, he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. I think today we would have fought this so hard. We would say we need to find a Christian magistrate who will make sure this doesn't happen. We need to get the laws changed is what the problem was. But what happened in this context, God did more than that, and they had a baptism service. Many that we, we learned that this morning... Uh, they, we, I pray that we'll baptize many ignorant and foolish men because of our excellent behavior like we just saw in that context. So let's take a look then. Here's our outline this morning. In verse 13, we have a command. And also in verse 13, the second point, he shows a motive. And then in 13 and 14, he shows what extent our submission to the government is to be. And then the result is we're going to silence ignorant, ignorant men and foolish men, and then there's a warning, and then we'll close out with a point of application. So let me begin in verse 13. I want you to see first the command that Peter's given. Uh, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or governor. So this is not what you would expect Peter to say. Nero is a bad man. Nero is an evil man. He is bent on destroying Christians. This is very surprising to the spirit of the age that we live in. This is a bad man. Submit. Submit. It's in the aorist imperative. It's a command, kind of like a, a snapshot of your life. Be in submission to your authorities. The Greek word is hupotasso. It means to rank under. So bring yourself under these leaders and be in submission and rank yourself under them. Uh, come under them. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 13. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So God is the one who has established these authorities. They're from Him, so you are submitting to God by submitting to these created authorities. So therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who opposed him will receive condemnation upon themselves. And so we need to be submissive to the governments and the structures that God has ordained and created. And our command is to hupotasso, come under them and be submissive from the heart. We'll look at that next. And so one quick question is why? <laughs> well, why, why would we submit to Nero's and Nebuchadnezzar's and Clintons and Obamas and Trumps. Why? I, I, don't, I don't like how our government's being run. I, I don't like how they use my tax dollars. There's so much unrighteousness in our government, and the, the list goes on and on of why I don't need to be submissive to the government. And so what I want to point out to you in our next point then is the motive. What, what should be the motive that we're going to bring ourselves into submission to these governing authorities? The motive, he says in verse 13, is very simple. For the Lord's sake. Well, how is that? Well, the Lord has established authorities in government and leadership and structures for what? For our good. Anarchy is a dangerous thing. When, when people quit obeying the laws of the land and the rules, anarchy is just chaos. And it breaks down the common grace and design that God has given to his creation in the form of government. 
And so we're tasting of this a little bit right now in our own country. And it's doing much harm to our society as more and more people are becoming anarchy and they're, they're disobeying and not obeying any kind of authorities or rules or police officers. And it has caused a major, major problem. It promised freedom, but it's bringing bondage and destruction to our very country. And so the first thing I want you to get then uh, from this passage is that the Bible is not a book about how to live in this world first and foremost. And uh, you probably have never heard a pastor say that. The Bible is not a book about how to live first and foremost in this world, but it's first and foremost a book about how to live to God in a fallen world. This teaches us about a salvation that God has brought, and now we are learning how to live to this God in a fallen world. So all of this is about is I want to live unto God. That is where we begin. That's the beginning of all wisdom, as Rick preached. So Paul said, through the law, I died that I might live to who? That I might live to God. So my life now is that I live unto God. I live under his authority. I live through God. I live for him and for his glory. So my life now is one taken up with God. And so this is not a book about politics. It is a Godward book calling us to a Godward life. This is not just a call to submission to authority. You will miss this whole message. Too many just see it that way, and that's why they're failing miserably in it. This is a submission to God. This is a Godward subordination of our hearts, and it goes to our president, it goes to police officers, school boards, teachers, bosses, even husbands. And so he's going to give us a list of all these authority structures that God has established, and you come under them, and you submit to them as unto God. And this is how we express our worship to God. I worship God by being in submission to my authorities that he's put over me. Anything contrary is how we express allegiance to ourself. This gives life to our subordination. This is what makes it glad surrender. I've seen more ladies find hope and joy when they finally realize that I am submitting to God and it's my worship to him, not my husband. And that's a beautiful thing. And so even with your government right now, I want you to see this is your worship. It is a submission to God. And I pray what this could do to the church's witness again if we would lay hold of this. To submit to the authorities over us with glad hearts. And to share the truth with those who see something so beautiful in us. That all claims they bring against us, they won't stick or they have no substance. uh, Except that they claim to worship a dead man named Jesus Christ. So my question as we begin is, how are you doing at this? I think the church's lack of understanding of this has done harm, and it's really bringing persecution upon ourselves. We've hurt our witness because we've become more about fighting them with flesh, moral legislation than the detailed teaching and preaching of God's Word to grow up people who will be bright lights in society. The church, in many places, has become obnoxious, (laughs) not because of their message, but because of the spirit that we're taking on this morning. So the command is be submissive, and the motive is because it's unto God. And thirdly, I want to say, what's the extent? What is the extent of this? And if you'll look back in verse 13 and 14, you're to submit to every human institution. Did you hear that? Every. Whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. You mean it isn't just the ones we agree with? I'm good if they're Republican. I'm good if they're Christians. I'm good if they agree with my stance. He's saying every human institution. God is the maker of every human institution. He's over our government. And everyone needs to submit to this authority. And it is a gift from God to preserve society. And how is he going to do that? Well, he's going to punish evildoers. And so society is going to be called to bring punishment to those who break these laws and praise to those who do right. That's the primary role of government, and and the government starts going way beyond that. And so the sorrow of my heart is that we have quit punishing evildoers. We reward them. We reward them. And we certainly have quit rewarding those and giving praise to those who do right. These citizens who are faithful and do the right things, that's been lost And so we're watching the death of a nation. But hear this. Please hear this. 
God did not save us to save America. Okay? Turn off CNN. He saved you to glorify himself and to save lost souls. Okay? That's our calling. And one of the ways is by following this command that's before us this morning. So don't forget this. Our government, this is like a dam given by God to protect against the rivers of depravity. Remove them and you will have anarchy. And in places where you see this, you see how precious it is to have jails and laws and police officers and courtrooms. Go to Rwanda and and live in that. You'll love the structure here in America. And, And we need to be grateful to God for these structures. And we need to be submissive to these structures as unto God. And so these systems are from God so that every man can live peaceably on this earth. The civil government is the work of God for your good. And so a good translation would be this. Submit yourself to every God-ordained human institution. Submit yourself to every God-ordained human institution. Amen? Yeah, but we have so many bad judges and leaders. How about Nero? We would, he would crucify the guy who's writing this upside down because of his love for Jesus Christ. And he's the one saying, submit to your authorities. Preaching and praying, and then accept the consequences that come upon us from our government. And so we accept what they bring upon us as we be faithful to God first and foremost. We are preachers of righteousness, not defiers of the law. Some of you have such arsenals that you, you could probably send a missionary overseas with how much gun and ammunition you have in your basement. <laughs> Goodness. We're... We are not the fires of the law. We're preachers of righteousness. The church needs to hear that again. I don't know where we've lost that, but we need to come back to this. In verse 15, what would be the result of this? Look with me. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, submitting to the authorities, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Here's the way we change society. Not by our reasoning and arguing with them. It's not by legislating morality, fighting for our government to do this biblically, but it's by our godly living is the means that God has given. The word silence means to muzzle or gag, to to muzzle these foolish people standing against God's kingdom. Muzzle them or gag them by doing what is right. It means nobility, righteous conduct, good citizenship. So by living this way, you do this and you will gag the foolish, Peter says. Listen to who will be gagged. The ignorance, it means willful, hostile rejection of the truth. So those who are hostile and rejecting the truth and at enmity with it, the foolish, they're senseless, they don't have reason, they lack mental sanity, they're willful rejectors of the truth. That's what we're listening to on these talk shows all day long, every day, and everyone's trying to reason and argue with them. So you see and hear them in Congress every day, and they're in your path all day long. How can we muzzle such people? Good citizenship, a virtuous life, impeccable character, purity of life, everything that we've learned in Peter thus far, you live this way and you will silence them. Titus in chapter 3, he said, remind them, remind them to be subject to their rulers and to authorities and to be obedient and to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one. Hear that again, to malign no one. I don't care what their affiliation is, malign no one. To be uncontentious, not fighters and brawlers, but be gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Guys, this is the weapon that God has given to the church. This meek, Christ-like truth and love that goes forth and submits to authorities and, and models the beauty of Christ. We're trying to argue and reason with the unreasonable. Try, we try to fight and battle them with our wits. This is the apologetic that the world is crying for, is these kind of men and women and children living this way. Then Peter gives a warning 
our fifth point in verse 16. <clears throat> Act as free men. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Uh, I want you just to listen as we begin this verse, a quote from Martin Luther. Luther said, a Christian is a perfectly free one. He's subject to none, and yet a Christian is a perfect, dutiful servant of all, subject to all. He's free from all, and he's subject to all. It seems like a paradox. He says, these two theses seem to contradict each other, but both are Paul's own statements when he said, I'm free from all men, but I've made myself a slave to all men. And so there's this beautiful paradox mystery is that you're free through submission in verse 16. So Peter says, live as, as if you're free as slaves to God. So we can be free because we're slaves to God? That doesn't, don't you think that might need a little bit of explanation? I'm free to be a slave to God? Because that doesn't sound like freedom to me. And that's because of how the world thinks about freedom. How does the world define freedom? They say freedom is to be free from any kind of constraints. I have no constraints. There's no one I have to obey, no one I have to serve, no promises that I have to keep. I have freedom from any restrictions. And that's how the world defines freedom. And that doesn't fit with what Paul or Peter is saying here. Which is funny because Romans 6 says we are all a slave to something. We're either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. Everybody is a slave. So an unbeliever boasting of their freedom is absolute deceit. They're in bondage to sin. And so this boasted freedom is simply not true because all of that they do as an unbeliever, you're a slave to sin. You're either a slave, maybe it's your career, and you're so given to that that you'll forsake everything else you're given to your lusts where that's all you can do or think about. You're a slave to your bank account, your retirement account, is you will be a slave to something. I heard this week about a man who boasted. He said, I'm free, and I'm free to date anyone I want. I can have little flings with whoever I want and whenever I want, and I never have to get serious in any relationship. I am free now to go wherever I want and do whatever I want. Well, what's his restriction? He can't have a devoted relationship, can he? And so right away, in his boasted freedom, there's a restriction. And so no one, I want you to hear this, is free in that sense. So however the Christian has been brought into true freedom, we, he's saying you have true freedom by being a slave to God. There's a restriction instantly in your freedom. Because of regeneration, I am free for the very first time now to be a slave to God to do what is right and obey God for the first time in my life. And it's coming from the innermost being. The law is being written in my heart. And now I love and serve God. So I am free to be a slave to God. It's the freest thing I've ever done or ever had. I can be a slave to the living God. One preacher said it, freedom is finding a liberating restriction. I have a liberating restriction. I'm a slave to God. And so freedom, he says this way, he said, I like the illustration, he said, it's like a fish in the water, and all of a sudden the fish one day says, you know what, I hate being restricted by water. I'm free after all, so I, I don't need this water, and he goes out onto the land, and he starts flopping and gasping and dying like fish do, and, and the question is why he, he wasn't designed for the land, but put him back into the water, and there he goes again happily. He's restricted to the water, but he's free because he's made for it. And all of his potential is released in the water. And so God created you for himself. And I don't want to be restricted. I want to be God. I want to call my own shots. And you're flopping and gasping and drowning, aren't you? That was my testimony for 20 years. But you, the water for your soul, the living water of Jesus Christ has come and brought you back to God and now you're a slave to him and you serve him and you have unconditional obedience which is the freedom of your heart to prosper in the restriction of living water. So as I drink the living water of Christ, I am free to blossom and have freedom to serve and be a slave of the living God. Isn't that beautiful what the gospel does in a heart? Now I'm jumping back into the water, and God is my allegiance. It's, it is so free. So if you're gasping and flopping spiritually this morning, the answer is something else has your allegiance. 
If that's your whole life, you're just, I've been a Christian for 20 years and all I do is gasp and flop spiritually, something else has your allegiance. And so I need to surrender and find this beautiful freedom in being a bond slave and a servant of God. So don't use your freedom that has come in Christ as a covering for evil. Pride, arguing, fighting for your rights, fighting for your choice of president, all of these different things, you're just fighting, fighting, maligning, and I'm just free. I'm free as a Christian. I can do these things. He says, don't use that freedom as a covering for the evil that's going on. Obey God. Submit to all the authorities that he has created for your good. That's freedom. And how many will use their freedom as a cloak or a mask to cover your evil? And then your condemnation is just. And so don't use the freedom of being a Christian for evil. You are free to be a bond slave of God. Application. Look with me in verse 17. So Peter just kind of closes out with the thoughts then. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. So no matter what their political view, honor all men. Wouldn't that be beautiful for all of America to hear that again? Honor all men. Give weight and substance that their image, they've been made in the image of God. Give, give honor to all men. All men, no matter, again, no matter what their political view Give honor to every kind of man, parents, teachers, leaders, presidents, liberals. It's time that we turn off the Rush Limbaugh's, and I know that's holy ground for some of you, and I'll tell you why, because the talk is disrespectful, and it teaches you to talk disrespectful, and it makes you think that Democrats are your enemies instead of your mission field. Okay, And so what I want us to see is that we're to honor all men and we need to have a heart for all men and to show them and to quit disrespecting one another in this way. It just needs to stop. And if it stops here, we'll silence foolish and ignorant men. And then let's go a little further. Love the brotherhood. Do you think Peter really means this? He won't quit saying it. Again and again and again, love the brotherhood. You are free to love each other, to lay your lives down and quit just spending it on yourself. Spend and be spent for the good of others. It's more that, it's more that, that we, we don't just give the body of Christ honor, but we flat out give them love, and we love each other. And then fear God. Fear God because we are slaves to him. He's a holy God, and we're His, and we have the blessed freedom to obey Him and serve Him. Fear God. All that we do on this earth has to have Him at the center of it, and it has to be our submission to government has Him at that place. And so I joyfully submit to this government because I'm a slave of God. Joyfully. And then honor the King because He's been appointed by God. And, and this is Nero when Peter wrote this. So I want you to hear this. I don't care whether you like President Trump or not. You honor him because God has appointed him over this country for this season. And we don't spend all our days slandering and maligning and disrespecting and disobeying our leaders. And so Christians are going to be different. We're going to be so different in this society if we'll live and walk and talk and act this way. And people will start asking you, what's the hope within you? So may God use these kind of people. I'm going to call it evangelistic citizenship. To silence the ignorance of foolish men. And the Bible is not mainly about how to live in this world, but how to live to God in this world. And so may he get all the glory and honor and praise from this church as we live lives of this kind. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God because we would have got this wrong. And, and Lord, I pray for those of us who have it wrong as we sit here, even this morning, that right now there would be repentance. Lord, that we would repent of wrong motives and wrong spirits and slandering tongues. 
and that we've taken away the, the power that you've given to destroy fortresses and to knock down these speculations of foolish men and that the, the means you've given, we, we've been using the world's means. We've been using the flesh to fight this. And so I pray that we'll fight it with the word of God and we'll fight it through prayer and through humble submission and excellent behavior among the Gentiles, and that we will preach the Lord Jesus at any cost and then receive whatever the consequences that come upon us from this government joyfully, that maybe we'll have a baptism service because of it like they did in Philippi. And so I pray, God, that you would use this church in a mighty, mighty way to be the light of Jesus Christ, that they would see the marvelous light that we've been called into by this bride. And so, God, do your work, have your way, and be magnified and glorified by this sweet group called Southside Bible Church. And it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen.